I want to talk today about the winnowing of God. And um, I want to start out with a couple of foundational scriptures, okay? The first one is in Revelations 4, 9. And it says, Worthy, O Master, yes, our God, take glory, take the honor, take the power. You created it all, and it was created because you wanted it. You know, I learned it as for his pleasure, all things were created. It's not, it wasn't like, you know, well, he just wanted to have, you know, we have such a weird earthly definition of pleasure. Can you just say that you need to rewrite your definition of pleasure? But for his personal desire, think about that for a minute, for God's personal desire, everything was created because he wanted it. That includes you. I hope... um, don't you really hope that you just eventually get over yourself? Yes. Yeah. Has anyone gotten over themselves at all? Yes. It's so good, isn't it, to finally get over yourself, yes. right? And um, Cece, she told me this morning, she woke up with a scripture in John. It was actually the same basic passage that I was reading in Matthew. And so I like this sum- summarization in John three twenty seven. It says, A person cannot receive even one thing unless God gives it. So today God is giving you something because he wanted to. He didn't do any special thing. But just because he wanted you to have it today. And so that means that some of you are prepared to receive it in a new way. And it makes me exciting. It makes me excited. And exciting. I'm exciting. Um, Let's start with my punchline, okay? Just in case I get lost today. Let me read you my scriptures for today. John 3, 16 and 17. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. John 10, 14 through 18. Psalm 8, 7 and 9. Hebrews 4, 14, Isaiah 21, 10, Isaiah 41, 13, Luke 3, 16, Matthew 3, 11. So if I don't get to all of those, they're on the recording, and you can go find them out for yourself. Cause, but I want to start with my punchline, and it's Isaiah 41. Now let me tell you a little bit about Isaiah 41. When I was a little girl, I've told you this story many times, fear walked into my life. And I propose that every single person on the planet, fear walked into your life as a child because you were not, from God's design, you were not brought into this world to have fear. That's why it's the most um, spoken thing by God to humanity is fear not. And I believe that you can live life fear free. And when fear masquerades as wisdom, you make choices with your finances and time, the two things that you have stewardship over that produce no fruit and it brings and yields discouragement. And over time, you'll quit doing it because you'll say God doesn't pay off. And it's really just the truth of the matter is that you are actually serving the God of fear and the God of fear causes you to do actions that cannot be fruit producing items by God. All right, let's go home. (laughs) And so my mom taught me Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I'm with you. My King James Version was don't be dismayed or confused because I'm your God. That just establishes that he's with me and it established him being as being enthroned in my life. And so I've spent a lifetime enthroning him as God. Because I can do nothing without him. And I'm not ashamed to say that I can do nothing without him, that all the good in me is him. And I've chosen many times over, sometimes a daily choice, to choose to live by what he says I am versus what I feel like I am. And, you know, at any given time in your history, in your future, 
And the enemy's target could change over your life and he could begin to target you for some random reason that you don't know. But there are other times in your life that the Holy Spirit is actually separating the wheat in you from the chaff in you. And I want to talk to those today who are willing to hand the sickle to the one and allow him to winnow you on purpose. I know everyone in this room doesn't want to be winnowed and it's okay, but I want a daily winnowing. I want to describe to you the purpose of me choosing to allow the Holy Spirit to do in me what He needs to do in me so that I will be made into the person that can actually wield His Spirit in fullness. You know, there's so many people so hungry for the Holy Spirit, but there's few people that will actually hand the winnowing hook to the Holy Spirit to let Him sort us. And the truth of the matter is is that you just have some ways and ways of thinking. You have some things about you that the Holy Spirit can't anoint. And, And He is so good and so loving that He will protect you from His anointing because of the weight of His anointing until you're able to let Him sift what's really true in you. And that's just all that's going on. It could be fun. Or it could be treacherous. It could be excruciating. Cece told me this morning that Johnny Enlow made a mention and went along with Shooty's example in her room. Don't you love Shooty? This is she's in her room and she's just doing what God told her to do. She don't even know why she's doing it. She didn't even know until I laughed when I when she told me what she almost said. She almost pulled that. Well, I'm just not going to tell you. You know, kind of thing. I'm like, oh no, you've already started now. You have to tell me. But Johnny Enlow said that um, the next seven years are going to be excruciating justice for the wicked and exhilarating justice for those that love the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to tell you another story today about something about seven years. But first, let's read my punchline because see, I've almost already run down the road and y'all don't even know it. Back to Isaiah 41, and Isaiah 41 is chock full of deliciousness. If you want a buffet with Jesus, it's Isaiah 41, and I've feasted on it many times in my life. But I'm going to start past my life scripture verse of Isaiah 41.10. I'm going to go down to 13. This is after he told us to fear not, remember? Do you need me to read Isaiah 41.10? Because I just sort of quoted it. So let's don't have to read it, okay? You'll be all right, won't you? Okay, I'll go read it because some of you are struggling already. (laughs) I don't even know if I have it pulled up. Let me see. Where are you? Did I mention how many scriptures I had? Bless you. See, this is why. Here it is. Isaiah, we'll start at... um, Verse 9, you know, it's really good. The rest of it's good. But it says, I drew you to myself from the ends of the earth. And I called you from its furthest corner. You know, Cece had a dream last night that when she was nine months old, she went to Turkey. Her family, they were nomads, but she's not a nomad. So you can see how that was hard on her. I was thinking about the scripture when she told me that. I was like, think about where you came from to get here. Some of you haven't ever been out of the state, and that's okay. But some of you have come from way far away. So I drew you to myself from the ends of the earth, and I called you from its furthest corner, and I say to you, you're my servant. I've chosen you. I've not rejected you. This is personal. This is to you today. So don't yield to fear, for I'm always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I'm your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every single situation. And I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. You're going to need to know that's your position when you read the rest of this. All who rage against you will be ashamed and disgraced. All who contend with you will perish and disappear. You will look for your enemies in vain. Those who war against you will vanish without a trace. This is my verse, starting in verse 13. 
I am Yahweh, your mighty God. I grip your right hand and won't let go. We sang that this morning. I whisper to you, don't be afraid. I'm here to help you. Put your name in here, but this is the name. Jacob, I've talked about him before. Although you feel like a grub worm. Put your name there. Teresa, although you feel like a grub worm, have no fear. Because a worm feels pretty small, right? I am here to help you. I am your kinsman redeemer. I don't have time to preach on it, but a kinsman redeemer is somebody who has chosen to take the place to protect you, to be there for you, to redeem your sins, all those things. Verse 15, this is the verse of the day. I am making you into a powerful threshing instrument with teeth new and sharp. You will reduce hills to chaff and crush mountains into dust. You will winnow them and the stormy wind will blow them away. Then you will spin and dance with rejoicing in Yahweh. We did that this morning. Boasting with admiration in the Holy One. I, Yahweh, will respond to the cry of the poor and needy. And when they are thirsty and their tongues are parched with thirst, when they seek a drink of water but there is none, I will not abandon them. And I will open up refreshing streams on the barren hills and springing fountains in the valleys. I will make the desert a pleasant pool and the dry land springs of water. And I will plant in the treeless desert cedars of acacia, myrtle, and olive trees. And I will set in the wilderness evergreens together with many elms and cypress. And everyone will see and know that I am Yahweh. And with my mighty hands I have done this. And they will consider and comprehend that the Holy One of Israel has created it. I wanted to propose to us today that God is making us a threshing instrument, but I have to be threshed myself to be the instrument. One of the things about God is that He always takes what I've been through to make it healing for somebody else. It doesn't mean that it becomes your life call, although it may. But he'll take an experience that you claim was your hardest time, worst time, worst experience, worst trauma, worst this, and he redeems it because he's the kinsman redeemer. And he redeems it into something that is life-saving for someone else. Because, you know, in essence, if you can ever get this understanding, your experience is not unique. I know you want it to be so bad. I know there's something about it that gives it more validity and weightiness, and you feel like you can get more people on your side, and you feel like you could, you know what I'm saying? You know, I was out working with bro the other day, and that's proverbial working. He was working. I was pointing, but... um. <laughs> But I went to open the gate, and when I did, I smashed my hand in the gate. And it was really excruciating. And my first thing when I get hurt is I want to run and tell someone. Why? Why? We want comfort. We want someone to know our plight. Now, I've learned a long time ago that no one cares that I've smashed my hand in the gate. I know you think you care, but you just don't. Like if I'd have called you, I know, if I'd have called you at the bank and you were helping the president of the bank and I said, Cheryl, I've smashed my hand, that would not be that important. Do you understand? We want, and, and see, we often pick people who don't have the capacity to give us 
what we're looking for. But see, I know how he winnows me. See, you have to become acquainted that, that God knows there's gold in you. How does he know? Because he made it. And he knows that the enemy created lies in you. And so we would just look at those two things. He's got to thresh the lies out of your life. So the goal will come forth. So let's just think about what threshing, what winnowing is. You know, threshing is actually this movement that, Shudy, let me give you a little small wheat lesson. In Bible days, they actually harvested wheat. Now, they didn't have all the big machines like we have today, right? And they weren't gluten-free. So um, <laughs> they, they wanted wheat. It was a good thing. And God provided it on the earth. Say that over your body. God provided it to feed me and nourish me. And let's don't get into the technicalities of what we do to it today. But anyway, they would plant wheat and there, there would become a time where they would harvest wheat. And in the harvesting process, they just had a big sickle. And they would do what they called, they would thresh the wheat and they would run this sickle that was really sharp. And it was just in this motion right here. And they would just walk and they would just cut at a really low level. They would cut the wheat off. And then someone would come behind them. And this thing had happened while the wheat was growing. There was some wheat pods that had nothing in them, no fruit in them. And they called those chaff. And there were, they also had weeds that grew up with them. And what would we call those? Lies. And, but they would just thresh it all together as one. And then the sorter would come. Now the sorter only took the weeds out. They just bundled the wheat and the chaff together. And they would take that and they would take it to the threshing floor. Now the threshing floor wasn't like what you probably think. The threshing floor, there were many types. But one of the main types was that they would just throw out a little bit of it on this big circle. And every family had a threshing floor. Turn to your neighbor and say, every family had a threshing floor. Now remember, Jesus is using this analogy. Let me read in Luke. He says, He has in His hands a winnowing fork to clean up His threshing floor, and He will separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat He will gather into His barn, but He will burn the chaff in fire so that no one could ever, that, in a fire that no one can ever put out. So in this process, here we've got this gathered wheat and chaff together. So they would lay it on the ground, and they would, they would pick an animal, or they would pick a bunch of children or something, and they would stomp around on the wheat and chaff together. And as they stomped around, they could, they also had a big wooden board that they would stick rocks in underneath and they would put even children on that and they would drag it around because they needed to be weighty. Now the key was you just wanted to winnow long enough that the wheat and the chaff would be separated. And how did that occur? Because the chaff was so lightweight, it had no fruit in it. It was a lightweight. The, the seed pod, the wheat pod, was a grain, a kernel. It wasn't easily crushed. And so what would happen then is they normally had this threshing floor up high. So that after the threshing occurred... The winnowing part is they would just let the wind blow the chaff away because it was so lightweight. Now, if you if you watch some videos about it nowadays, they just to show you the example, they will actually just take and pour the little grain and have a little box fan and it will blow and the chaff is so lightweight, it'll just blow the chaff right off the seed. It's not hard to separate the chaff from the wheat. But it's the winnowing. We get threshed, and then we have to be winnowed, and then the Spirit of God has to blow through our lives. And I'm just proposing that He's making you 
into a winnowing. He's making you the one that stomps around. Let me tell you what what winnowing means. Just ask me if you really want to be one. Threshing means winnowing. Current a, a current of air begins to separate it. It's harvesting. It's drubbing. It's infliction. It's putting it through. It's combining, trouncing. It's flailing, tossing, slashing. In the English dictionary, it says to beat out grain from its husk. To beat grain out or to strike it with a flail. Threshing or thrashing is the process of loosening the edible part of the grain from the straw to which it's attached. It's the step in grain preparation after reaping. So let's just translate this metaphorically. If we're called to harvest, then we've reaped something. I propose to you we're not good at winnowing. It's kind of what I was talking to Lynn about today. Lynn had a winnow yesterday. And she was worried her winnowing was too... What do you think she was worried about, knowing Lynn? It was too harsh. It was too... Putting it through. It was too drubbing. Right? Why? Because what are we doing when we're we're winnowing? Do you always know that you have chaff with your wheat? See, when when they plant, they didn't plant chaff. The farmer didn't go out and say, I'm going to do a whole field of this chaff. After we've Winnowed it a little while, it'll all blow away and I'll have zero. See, they had to learn the process of getting the fruit out. Do you? Are you willing? Listen, as a laid down lover, the one thing I had to be willing to do, I had to be willing to let him sort the things in my life that were not going to bear fruit. And they looked the same to me. Listen, they looked the same to me. Because I have good intentions in my head. They looked the same to me. But see, a laid down lover is like, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. If he says it won't bear fruit then it's not going to bear fruit. If he says, that's chaff, then I just say, winnow me. I don't care if you need a board with a baby. I don't care what kind of contraption you use. And see, the further that you go in the maturing process, the further you'll realize that you need the fruit of the Spirit, which obviously is love. You need only love to remain because when I'm when I know we all want to minister to people in here that's not a secret please hear me today I'm just trying to help you get over yourself like every day of your life and realize that this is a process that you have to invite him in. You have to hand him the winnowing uh, instruments. You have to give him the tools, which is the permission to come. And if he needs to smash you way down on the ground and runs over it again and gets a baby and puts it on the board and runs over it again and you feel rocks in your back and you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. At the end of the day, the only thing that remains because he knows how much is fruit. And see, when we get in that process and we feel a little pain, we want to call somebody. I hope my finger. When we get in a place of maturing and we feel a little pain, we want relief. We want to call. Oh, I just got it. The person I dreamed about last night, that's what they would do. They would call for relief. They knew who to call to get them out of the winnowing process. And see, if I'm not aware of that, 
I may not actually pick up the phone because I may be an introvert and I'm not going to tell anybody, but I'm actually internally trying to get out of this discomfort. And I subtly make suggestions or I make plans or I purchase something. I do something all what to get myself out of the discomfort of winnowing. But listen, this Jesus. <laughs> In Isaiah 21.10, you got to read Isaiah 21, okay? This is what he said, my people, the ones lying crushed on the threshing floor. <laughs> Do you want him to say that to you? Yes. Do you want him to say, oh, there's Aaron, the one crushed, laying on the threshing floor, who would take his Friday off and come over and do a bunch of really hard stuff? Because why? He just wants to be a son. He wants to be my son. I'm sure he had something else he could have done that day. But I'm making you into a powerful threshing instrument with teeth new and sharp. Why? Because there's hills and mountains. What are the seven mountains? There's hills and mountains. You're probably attracted to them right now. Your mountain, you're attracted to it. But if you're not careful, you'll, you'll become subservient to the God of that mountain as opposed to dethroning him. I'm sure you're attracted to the thing that God called you to change. You know, it's the weirdest thing about as we mature, he begins to speak to us about things, and if we're not careful, we'll put the wrong attachment to it. You know, last week, I was, I was, I told you I on Saturday night, remember that I just had a lot of torment that night. And one of them was, you know, that, we weren't going to sell our house, you know. I didn't want to make a bunch of house payments double up, right? And, of course, this week we had an offer in our house. Well, at the same time, Cece was telling me about another thing that Johnny Enlow said, and he was talking about Aaron Rodgers. I don't know if you know him, but he's a football player. And just thank God you're not OU football coach this week. But And he was also, if you think you had a bad week, just... <laughs> Just wish, just be thankful you're not the OU football coach today. But you don't know anything because something happened since 1965 last night. But anyway, that's okay. You don't have to know all that information. It's just trivia in my head. Aaron Rodgers, thank you. And Roger Marin, he's a baseball player. Anyway, some things happened, and, and Johnny Enlow was quoting those things. And I laughed because the guy buying our house, is, his last name is Rogers. And what's the chances of that, right? And see... If we're not careful, the thing that God is indicating to us that he's about to do will wrap it in fear like a bacon wrap filet mignon. And we'll think, oh my gosh, that's him. Don't think about filet mignon right now. That's what, we'll think that's him. We'll think that fear thought is God. And that's why he said in Isaiah 41.10, you can't fear. You've got to know I'm enthroned. You've got to know I'm dancing with you because I'm trying, he's trying to teach us to spin. Yeah. That's what he's trying to teach us to do. You'll spin. You won't even care that you're tired. Yeah. Do you understand that Jesus said, I have bread you don't know of. Yeah. See, God has energy you don't know of. If you become focused, I know for Shooty, she can become, I just think about this week that she had just in ministry alone. And there's just a weight anyway on leading. And, and I think, well, how did she get to do that today? I mean, they had a whole hour and a half session before y'all even got here this morning. How does she do that? Because she has bread you don't know of. She has strength you don't know of. She's being infused with power to stand up here and scream. I mean, you don't get it. But that is something that's what your calling does. It infuses you with strength and power. And see, that's the interesting part if you think about Isaiah 41, because then he says that he'll respond to the poor and needy that are thirsty. Who's the drink? I mentioned it last week. You're the drink. Yahweh will respond with you 
to somebody else. I know you thought it was just all about you not being thirsty, but it's not. Listen, if you're being winnowed, you don't even care if you're thirsty. He's making you into a powerful threshing instrument with teeth new and sharp. You'll reduce the hills to chaff and crush the mountains into dust. Do you want to do that? Yes! Then you have to give him the tool to separate the wheat from the chaff in you. You can't thresh others if you haven't yourself been threshed. You have your ability to identify what the Holy Spirit is saying has to be quicker. Everybody can figure it after they've got 10 confirmations. You're a voice before there's a voice. You're to speak before you get 25 confirmations. You are to know that he's saying something here in this house. And yes, he's saying it in other houses, but we have to forge it brand new. You know, Bill named his sermon Angel Food Cake. He just stole that from me because I just named a sermon food last week, last month. You've got to be the voice, not the echo. You've got to be the one out in front. You've got to be the one that goes out and says what John said. And that's what I read first thing with with Cece's scripture. That was John saying it. John, the guy, John, not John that wrote the book. John, the baptizer. What? Why can't John the Baptist? A person cannot receive even one thing unless God gives it to them. John was saying that about Jesus. He was saying, the guy that's coming behind me, it's what he said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And then Jesus said, baptize me. And he said, oh no, Lord, baptize me. And Jesus said, no. He made John do his destiny, even though John wanted to give up his destiny. Listen, your destiny is not about your comfort. Well, if Jesus came and said, baptize me, or Jesus said, go say that to that person, then you just yield. Because a laid down lover has already been winnowed. And you know it. Others in here want to be winnowed. I get it. I get it. Y'all want to, but you're so scared of pain. And it is painful. You know why it's painful? Because you're focused on the winnowing instead of focused on what he's making. You know, a great example of this, and I didn't even pull the story, I'm going to tell you this from memory, okay, is Gideon. Now, Gideon, something in his story is about seven years. I can't remember if they were just in famine for seven years. Maybe that's what it was. But remember Gideon, God came to him and said, Hey, dude, my mighty man of valor. And he was like, I know you're not talking to me. Listen, the prophetic word over your life should make you feel that way. There ain't no way I can do that. No, you can't. And so what, did, what was Gideon doing? He was threshing wheat in the wine press. Why? There wasn't any grapes. I propose it was probably closer. So that tells me one thing about him. He was a man of convenience. The wine press, everybody had a threshing floor. Everybody didn't have a vineyard. But his family did. But he was like, we ain't got no grapes, baby. I'll just, I'll just thresh my wheat right here, right? In a place that I, I, it's just convenient. Wherever it was at, it was just more convenient than going to... The threshing floor, wherever it was. That's my that's my story. I'm not saying this true. But think about it for a minute. How often are we doing something in the wrong place at the wrong time and we don't even know? It's probably out of convenience. I don't know where these things were located. Maybe his family had a whole bunch of wine presses, right? We don't know. But the truth of it is he was doing the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what happened? God found him there. That's where he found you. You were doing the wrong thing at the wrong place at the wrong time. 
You didn't even know it. Did you? Mendel's such a great example, isn't she? She was at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, and she was miserable. I remember right, uh, she tells this story about, I don't even remember it, but how I told her, and it, it, before a year is out, you're not going to be at this job anymore. And, sorry, I thought they were talking to me. I just fly and zipped or something. <laughs> we good? Yes. Sorry, I'm not going to look at y'all anymore. <laughs> now, I don't remember telling her that. But she said, I just got out of the car. I didn't even say anything to you. Why did she do that? She was threshing wheat in the wine press. And someone called her what she really was. And and what did Gideon do? He was like, uh, remember he fleeced God to death. Some of y'all are still fleecing God and he's told you and told you. He's He answered all the fleeces. He gave people dreams about you. They told you that's what he did. He went down the enemy's camp. Remember, and he was like, I heard, I heard him talking about me down the enemy's camp. And the enemies actually said, Gideon is a mighty man of valor. And Gideon hadn't done nothing. Wow. Come on. Listen, he had reduced his life down to, well, we're in a famine. We'll just eat. Listen. That's more true than you know. When we don't know who we are, we just end up just eating. This is what we do. We just get by. We're just getting by. We're not out taking this instrument of ourselves and actually destroying the mountains of the enemy. You know, when I when we received our offer on our house this week, our little neighbor guy had said that he his brother wanted to buy it, so I thought it was him. And I didn't realize it, but the people that saw, some people came and saw our house the night we went and saw Super Spreader. And that was the people that put the offer in. And I was thinking to myself, think about when we were there that night. God was working on my behalf while I was sitting in the movie theater. That's such a good principle for me. Right? Because, you know, my thought is we got to have an open house. we got to, you know, five days, it's over. We're sold, done. Because why? That's, that's, he, he's doing something prophetically through everything. We drove by this place over here on uh, 150th and it's called, um, oh, that beauty, what? Beauty bomb or something. And there were like 50 women in line at the beauty bomb. And I'm sure they were giving away something free. I don't even know. I don't care. But I said, oh, that's prophetic. We would wait outside on Sunday morning for something free that's at the beauty place, the image place. But we wouldn't go, right, to the house of God. Right? See, everything, everywhere you go, God's speaking through something. It should be so much that you don't even have time to tell about it. Yes. And you should be on to the next thing. Yes. And on to the next thing. And on to the next. But every place he should be leading you and showing you over here, showing you over here, showing you the turtle on the road over here, showing you this. Yeah. Mendel took some pictures at night the other night and she saw the eye of God literally in the clouds. She's got a picture of it. More than one picture of it. I'm like, that's the eye of God. I can tell that's the eye of God. Why is he showing her that? See, you've got to know your area. He speaks to her through nature. I don't ever look at the clouds unless she tells me to. It's not on my mind, but he speaks to me through a bunch of other stuff. I could feel bad. It's a little intimidating because she's like, what? (laughs) She's got it on her phone. I'm like, here's a turtle. I got a picture of a turtle on a road. God spoke to me through this turtle on the road. I know you've got this magnificent sunset, this glory in the sky, and there's actually a huge angel, but I have a turtle on the road. Right? I mean, don't we do that? Don't we like, oh, I don't have it like she has it. Well, she didn't always have it this way. What did she do? She, be, she decided to set her gaze.
Listen, this is the reason we want to be winnowed. It's John 3, 16. You know it well. For this is how much God loved the world, that he gave his one and only unique son as a gift So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge it and condemn it, but to be its savior and its rescuer. I love the passion. He says that this salvation and regeneration must be by faith. See, Your faith is what first activated within you to believe why God wanted to save you. It's that same faith you're going to have to use to let him winnow you. Listen, this is beyond the door. This is beyond salvation. In my belief, God intended... Just think about how you feel about salvation. We all know we can't work for it. The religious spirit tried to make us think that we could have more of salvation if we just read our Bible a whole lot, didn't it? But we realized that it was what reading of the Word does in me that creates more experiences of salvation. I'm not making myself more saved by doing an act of reading. Listen, I'm trying to teach you a principle. It's the same way. At the same time you were saved, you were healed. So everything you've been healed of, just like salvation, is continually evolving. Your realization of healing is the same thing. So if you focus every day on something that hurts, then every day you get up, it hurts. Listen, if I was to focus every day on my sin... Every day I would get up and feel guilty for my sin. If I focus every day on, I have to live as if I've never sinned. I have to. I have to believe what he said. I know I feel like a worm, but I'm not going to act like I feel like a worm. The more I don't act like I feel like a worm. And how do I do that? I serve. the, the, The sign of salvation is I serve. Because I'm not my own anymore. Yeah. I love it. It's the sign that you're really saved. Yeah. That you're inconvenienced. Yeah. Because see, the love of God compels us to do what's on his mind. Yeah. And probably if I compare it to what I want to do, it's inconvenient. But for him, it's just the thing yeah. for that day. Once we get to the place where it doesn't feel inconvenient, we've actually matured into the plan of God. We've actually matured into yielding. The more that's on my mind about me, the more that's on my mind that touches me. Now see, this messes us up because a lot of us didn't even get any of our needs met, so then we're anemic in our need area. So then others of us, all we did was meet our needs and we called it something else. So you got to know where you are on this time, on this narrative i'm speaking about today and and if i'm so focused on me and then someone comes and makes a suggestion to me how about you serve others it might feel like a really big deal but if you're serving others all the time someone else might come and say hey you might need to focus on meeting a need of yours you're looking a little dry And if you don't know where you are on that narrative i assure you you will pick the thing that will be most convenient just like gideon did yes He said, we must receive it and do this by faith. True faith has these components. Acceptance. You're already accepted. Listen, you're not going to ever be able to do enough actions to make you more accepted. I propose, hopefully, by now, in our little tiny tribe, everybody feels accepted. I bet A's feel pretty accepted after Friday, right? Did you tell him that we were doing that? So he may have possibly been surprised. We don't know. <laughs> right? But see, when you have that feeling of accept, have you ever felt it? Yes. 
then you're just you're really, you're a risk taker because you're like this is there is no potential because what's the opposite of acceptance rejection there's no possibility of rejection that's why you have to be winnowed see only the people who have felt rejection got that the other component of true faith is embracing something or someone as truth. Listen, I am just telling you a truth today. His desire for you is to make you an instrument to remove the mountains of the enemy. You cannot do it in your state of chaff. And so there's stuff constantly, your rest of your life, you will be winnowed forever. You will be winnowed forever because there's always fruit and weeds and chaff growing all at the same time in every garden of your life. You can stand over there and try to weed it every day. It still grows. You know, I hate landscaping, but I love to look at it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to get down low. It's just, it's, I'm just being honest. But man, I have such a, I have such a vision for what it could look like. I'm just looking for a weeder. And see, that's what God is looking. There's just some people, they're just weeders of other people's lives. There's some people who are, they're going to ride on the piece of wood. They're going to put some weight on the wood as it runs across your wheat. <laughs> Know where, know who you are. There's some other people that are going to be out there sickling it down, harvesting it up. Just get the harvest in. I used to say about Pam, get out there and harvest and I'll clean them up. I'll winnow them in here. Why? Because I've been winnowed. I realize there ain't nothing good in this noggin of mine. It all had to be changed. And right now, it's just changing all the time. There's new definitions. I didn't even realize that when the promised land came and I walked into it in a new way that it was just going to be more responsibility, but I realized I got more power. But I got way more to do. I got way more to do. This season is a season of me doing an, an awful lot of stuff. Right? I'd gotten to a good place. I had my little house all fixed up. Just need one more strip of cock and I was going to be good. And that was going to be it. And I was done. I was good. I was just sitting back. And the Holy Spirit was like, you're going to be moving. No, look, we've just, look what we've done here, Holy Spirit. Look what we've done here. We've got this all fixed up. Don't make me move to brown, please. Just not brown. Anything but brown. And every door. All 700 doors are brown. I mean, they're not stained brown. They painted them brown. They painted them different colors of brown. How many colors of brown can you have? And so whenever we found the leak, I was like, mm, this is on the move. We're on the move right now, baby. Someone called me the next day, paid for it. I was like, oh, we're really on the move. We are really on the move. I finally got me a section all the other day. Yeah. It's going to be six weeks, and I'm going to be sitting in the sectional. Yeah. All the stuff from Christy's room just went to Pam's room. I mean, it just worked out, right? Why? Because he's just winnowing all the time. Yeah. And see, I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, he said there's a promised land. But that just means there's more to steward. And see, if my heart's full of weeds, lies, full of weighted down false fruit, it's just taking up space, it's not going to be an offering to someone else when they're hungry. Have you ever heard of someone making bread out of chaff? What do they even do with chaff? They don't even recycle chaff. There's no recycling. Are you with me? Yeah. It's the one thing that everybody agrees. Let's just let it blow away. Yeah. They still are letting it blow away. Yeah. They're not recycling. It doesn't do anything. Right. A little bit of fire, a little bit of fire. God touches it. It's gone. 
What's that paper that they magicians throw up in the air? Do you know what I'm talking about? Nobody knows what that's called. Do you know what it's called? Okay. What? Yeah, that. Flash paper. First John 3, I've read this recently, but look with wonder. How do you look with wonder? You don't go. <laughs> you say to yourself, I need to experience a greater depth. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love. Listen, every single thing that concerns you is on his mind. So let him winnow you and take care of all the stuff that concerns you. Don't act like the winnowing is over the stuff that concerns you. The winnowing is over your fruit. <laughs> that he has lavished on us. He has called us. He has called us and made us his very own. I'm not saying I'm ready. I'm just checking. <laughs> and made us his very own beloved children. God, the Father, the creator of the entire universe that holds everything suspended in the palm of his hand called you his beloved child. So let the Father winnow. Why in the world would we carry around false fruit? Because this is what happens. Pam will tell you, you step into a situation where someone's given you authority and she says, my hands are dead. I have no ability to change this person. So what did she did what did she do? They didn't even make her resign. They didn't care. Her hands were dead because they had a warm body to fill a ministry position. That happened to a lot of y'all in here. You were just a warm body. You had no power. You had no authority. You had no anointing. So don't be bringing up in here to me. Your chaff. And wanting me to be able to stick you in a place that you cannot maintain. But if you, if God has established you in a place, then you just need to be it. Don't make me convince you to be it. You need to walk in power. You need to walk in authority. You need to start knocking down some mountains. You need to start doing something with the permission that you've been given. I'm doing my thing. You do your thing. Let's do our thing together. Yes. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. So think of it like this. You've got the Jesus costume on. You're completely covered with the Jesus costume. It's Halloween. You can get into this a little bit, can't you? <laughs> so when you walk into a situation... Right? Because you've been winnowed by the master. And you got all of this fruit. Jesus is trying to give away fruit. And when they say, I don't want your fruit. You're just like, Jesus, they rejected you. I don't know what, I don't know what you're going to do about that. Jesus said, well, let's just dust our feet off. And go to the next place. We get so offended at why they don't recognize us. Don't you know I'm a good person? <laughs> Don't you know I'm really loving and caring and giving? Don't you know? No. They are so filled with weeds, they can't even see you. You know that bit emoji where there's all those weeds and, and your face is just barely sticking through it? That's them. And you brought, you brought Jesus up here with your costume on, and they're like, I don't know who you are. I don't see you. don't recognize you. Get out of my face. Boom. But see, the hungry one... It's like, I want, how, can you tell me how to wear the Jesus costume? Because I want to wear the Jesus costume too. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are, say who we are, who we are. is because they didn't recognize him. Beloved, we are God's children right now. Yeah. When are you, what, what do we need to do to just believe that all the time? If you're God's children, then God's speaking to his children. And his children know his voice. So he's going to tell you, hey, you know, you've been out till Breezy this year. So you know, you got healed of that thing. Well, there's someone in the next room having that thing you got healed from. So don't act like you need healing for it today. I told her yesterday, I told somebody, I said, now, when people come into me for a sozo and they are really not wanting a sozo, I'm just going to start calling it a solo because, <laughs> because they're not there for a sozo. 
they're just there for a solo. Th- I don't even really need to be there because they're doing that at home when I'm not even there, when I'm not with them. But but see, someone came in for something and she had the she had the words of life. But if she's not careful, she'll think it's her. We almost slipped down into that hole, and I was like, I don't think I think you already healed of that. Do you even know what you've been healed of? Well, then can he come and put that same feeling on you again and it not be about you or no? If he comes and says, hey, there's a spirit of depression, or you can go, I'm depressed. That's me. That's I identify as the depressed person. Or are you going to say, who is it? Holy Spirit, who is it? And it cannot be me because I've been winnowed. It cannot be me. I can't miss out on this opportunity to serve. I can't miss out on this opportunity to night down a mountain. i got to find the person it is. Or are you going to be like, well, I hope I, who can I call? I hurt hurt my hand. Who can I call? Feel good today. Who can I call? I have the same headache you always have. Okay, well then win some victory over it. Right? Listen, we do this thing where we repeat the same things over and over. And I guarantee you from heaven's perspective, he's like, I'm really trying to tell you a different message. Will you get this different message? How many would actually agree with me today that you want to live that way, that he's actually sending you a message from heaven and he's using all past things that you've actually been healed and redeemed from and you don't need to keep trying to get healing for it over and over and over. He's making you into an instrument with new sharp teeth. You want it to be sharp teeth. You want to be pointed and sharp, and you want to know how to hit it down at the very bottom so it all comes up. It says, we are God's children right now. However, it's not totally apparent what you're going to become. Are you okay with that? You know, when I told Cece that she wasn't going to be working at that job anymore, I couldn't see what she does today fully. I just had a tiny little foggy glimpse of her. But it it is constantly unfolding for her. I can see it fully now. And I can see all the things of her life and how I can see where the enemy was there. I can see still the things she struggles with now because the enemy, thats I can just see it. But see, she constantly gets winnowed. You know, she was up here yesterday and, and something, she was having a physical manifestation of something and she had sent me a text. I was just, it was early before we got started. So I came up here and I was telling her what the Holy Spirit, now she laughed and said at dinner last night, even when I was telling her last night what the Spirit told me, it, it made her uncomfortable. She couldn't quite do the thing I said that the Spirit said, but she said, I'm maturing because she didn't actually panic. See, her old self would have panicked at what I was telling her because what was I telling her? I was telling her a next step. I was telling her a step beyond where she was sitting on the platform. Listen, if you can understand this is how the, I wish y'all could understand what I'm saying right now. The Holy Spirit tells you something in advance. You're not even there yet. And it will make you really nervous. And he believes more in you, what he put in you, than you believe in you. So he'll give you advanced warning. He'll give you advanced instruction. Do you believe me or not? I wish you understood what I was saying today. And he gives you this advancement because he believes that the Holy Spirit in you will compel you to move forward. And when we believe that, When we will do, when someone tells us something like that, when we will do it, we will see the power of his anointing flow through us in a new way. It might feel awkward. It might feel like a huge, big old risk. Think about it. (laughs) Well, just think about it in the moment. Just think about it for a minute. The Holy Spirit's telling you something, and it feels risky to us. I mean, I do it too. But I'm like, well, it can't be risky with the Holy Spirit. Number one, he told me to do it. Number two, he empowered me to do it. And number three, he set up a situation for me to do it in. See, we have that mentality. I'll just sit back and let God. I'll let go and let God. I'll let go and let God. No, God grabbed me. Let's go. 
That's more like what God said. I got you by the right hand. Come on. He's on the move. Right now he's on the move. On the earth. He's on the move right now. I love this. In John 10, he says, I alone, I read this on Wednesday, am the good shepherd, and I know whose hearts are really mine. For they recognize me and know me. Just as my father knows my heart and I know my father's heart, I am ready to give my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that I will gather which are not of this Jewish flock. And I am their shepherd too. That's us, the Gentiles. And must lead them too. And they will follow me and listen to my voice. And I will join all of them into one flock with one shepherd. The Father has this intense love for me because I freely give my own life to raise it up again. That's really what he's asking of us today. He's trying to make you into something, but it's your ability to lay down what you have, to let him sort it, to let the wind of his spirit blow away all of the crap. Listen, the lies are sorted out before the winnowing even starts. He says, I surrender my own life and no one has the power to take it from me. It's the same with you. You surrender your own life. I can't do it. I can just be up here right now. That's what I'm really asking you to do. I'm really trying to encourage you to say, man, if you would just lay it down, if you just really fully surrender, if you just really understand what I'm saying today, if you'd really let him do this, you would come out in this place where you would just see all this fruit and then life would be way easier. He says, I have the authority to lay it down and I have the power to take it back again. You do too. You do too. But then he said this astounding statement. This is the destiny my father has set before me. Listen, I know the destiny God set before me. It's to train up people to not be a bunch of pandy waste Christians. And to walk in their power and anointing and to believe me and to believe him. And that's the destiny. You have got to know your destiny. You've got to know why you're on the planet. It's clear. The Holy Spirit doesn't hide it from us. He's not like some guy that is like going, okay, well, I hope they can figure it out, but I'm just going to hide it over here. No, all of the ways that he made you come to the surface. And when you let him winnow you, he will separate all the stuff that came from your soul, all the stuff that came from your past, all the stuff that was just false advertisement of fruit. And you'll see, oh my gosh, I, every single person has this thing of value yes. called fruit. Yeah. Just think about, can you, do you ever do this? I just think about who needs what I have. Yeah. Who needs the story that, that they were divorced or they were in the religious spirit or people told them that they shouldn't even preach? Who, who has a story that people made fun of their voice and made fun of their dialect, made fun of how they couldn't speak? Who has that kind of voice? Who's been told that they were all kinds of other identities that they were. Who has that same story? Who has your story? When you begin to champion what God did in you, He'll begin to breathe through you and champion your life to breathe and give somebody else a drink of what you have. Come on, Mendel. Some excited people in here. Such a good word, Tisa. Such a good, inspiring message. I pray that we all remember it the next time we feel the winnowing fork come to us and touch us. <laughs> Make contact. Next time the winnowing fork makes contact with us, let's remember this level of excitement. Right? <laughs> Being real. Okay, so um, as Tisa already mentioned, I woke up in the middle of the night and with I heard that um, highlighted was John 3.27, which says, Tisa has already read it, but it says that John answered them, a person cannot receive even one thing unless God bestows it. 
Now, there's obviously context for that comment, and there's a whole teaching on that. And Tisa um, had a teaching, you know, included that in her message today, too. But I kept asking the Holy Spirit what he, why did he tell me that? You know, why and what was he saying through me, to me, that he wanted to say through me on that message? And I heard it during worship, what the angle was. And I realized now after hearing Tisa's message um, that it's about our why, um, as she said, we this her whole message, we want to be winnowed so that we can be made a winnowing fork, so we can be made a threshing instrument for him, right? But why? Why? Why do we want to be a threshing instrument? Now, I know all of us have a lot of big hearts, and we have we want to minister to people, but I wanted to give us an extra oomph into um, a prophetic message about, of our why, or give our why an extra oomph. Um, about the timing of God. And this is why I think he's speaking this to me, is that a person cannot receive even one thing unless God bestows it. And the footnote in the Passion Translation says, no one of his own will can receive anything unless it comes to him from heaven. Now, the emphasis I thought was interesting that they used the word receive. As he's quoting this as another interpretation of the original scripture. No one of his own will can receive anything unless it comes to him from heaven. And so a different angle on this outside of, you know, your ministry and, and what the actual context of this, this line was, is how many people out there are trying to turn their will towards healing, are trying to find freedom, are trying to find wholeness, are trying to find peace with their will. I mean, this is the whole backing of the self-help industry, and it's really the whole thing that's behind all of this move of, you know, having no identity and all the gender stuff, and people are trying and are aiming their will at finding what we know only God can offer, right? And so think about it in terms of this, that no one can receive their healing. No one can receive peace. No one can receive their freedom, can be set free from the thing that's imprisoning them unless God bestows it. So the emphasis in my mind on this is that um, Johnny Enlow's word, which I'm not going to recap his word, but and so you can go and listen to it or read it from the past, it's really the past two weeks. But he um, gave a word that the emphasis of Isaiah 61 by God in this, at this point in time. And he said this, this phrase that just struck me in a way that I've, I've never thought of it before. I didn't know this. But he said, there has not been one generation, not one, to truly take on the mission of Isaiah 61. Not one generation to take on the mission of Isaiah 61. I was like, that ought not be. I mean, I've just been assuming that the body of Christ has been doing this for a while, and I want to join in and be a part of it too. But he's saying not one generation has truly taken on the true mission of Isaiah 61, backed up by the true heart of God and the true spirit of God. In other words, you, you preach to the poor, well, don't worry, you're not going to be poor once you reach heaven. Well, don't worry, there's there's, you know, beauty for ashes once you get to heaven. And don't worry, yes, you're a slave to sin, but there's Jesus, and so you can be saved from your sin, but that's where it ends. He said that doesn't fully encompass the heart of God. And when you think about how we know him here, I would agree. We know that that's not the, that's all, that's, that's not the extent of salvation. And so, I love that this house we all know is so focused on inner healing and bringing freedom and people into wholeness in this lifetime. And he was saying, and it's a really cool word if you go, it had all the sports, you know, the sports um, prophecies and all of that, how it lined up on Isaiah 61. But I want to propose to you that that is what God is bestowing. 
That is what God is bestowing. So a person cannot receive even one thing unless God bestows it. And we're hearing through the prophetic voices that Isaiah 61 is on his heart. It's a day of vengeance for the Lord. It is a time where he is fulfilling and bestowing the fullness of Isaiah 61. So that's our why. That's why we want to be eager to be winnowed. We want to be eager for that because this is what God's doing right now. He's saying the time has come. This is what we're doing. And so I want to read Isaiah 61 to you, and I, I may have to read the entire thing. The mighty spirit of Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives, you are free, and to tell prisoners, be free from your darkness. I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace, a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow now, now not just in the future after you suffer for a lifetime, but now to strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful bouquet in the place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears and the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. They will restore ruins from long ago and rebuild what was long devastated. They will renew ruined cities and desolations of past generations. This is us. This is what God's doing right now. This is our house. This is our ministry. This the fullness of Isaiah 61. I say we take it on and say nothing short of this. My life and my mission will be nothing short of the fullness of Isaiah 61. As long as I have breath, right? Foreigners will be appointed to shepherd your many flocks. Strangers will cultivate your fields and tend your vines. But you will be known as priests of Yahweh and called servants of our God. You will feast on the wealth of nations, nations and revel in their riches because you received a double dose of shame and dishonor. You will inherit a double portion of endless joy, of everlasting bliss. For I, Yahweh, love fairness and justice, and I hate stealing and sin. I will rightly repay them because of my faithfulness and enter into an everlasting covenant with them. Their seed will be famous among the nations and their descendants the center of attention of the people. All who see them will recognize that they are the seed that Yahweh has blessed with favor. I will sing and greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My whole being vibrates with shouts of joy in my God, for he has dressed me with salvation and wrapped me in the robe of his righteousness. I appear like a bridegroom on his wedding day, decked out with a beautiful sash or like a radiant bride adorned with sparkling jewels. In the same way, the earth produces crops and seeds spring up in a garden so will the Lord Yahweh cause righteousness and praise to blossom before all the nations. That is our why. I encourage you all to reread that. Read it yourself. Read it several times. It's not just a prophetic word about what God's going to do at some point in heaven. It's not just about the people of Israel. It's about us. It's about this time right now and the fullness. God deserves the fullness of this verse to be represented on earth, right? In his true heart, not from a religious heart or in a religious interpretation, but his true heart. I mean, what a greater way 
Um, could there be to honor him than to say, yes, I believe this, I believe this can happen, and I will partner with you to make this happen here right now with the people that walk through that door, with the people I meet on the streets, with the people I run into at work. This is our mission. This is our mission. And this is why we want to partner with being winnowed. That's why we want to yield to being winnowed and taken to the threshing floor. Now, just so, just in case you still don't believe that God was on this and the Holy Spirit was on John 3 today and all the other verses that Tisa read, but they're right above, above this in the chapter, they talk about the light of God has now come into the world, which we sang about in pre-service and prophesied and spoke into the atmosphere about the light, the light and how truth has won. Now, a little further down, in verse 30, John wraps up his, his commentary about a person cannot receive even one thing unless God bestows it. He says in verse 30, so it's necessary for him to increase and for me to be diminished. Now hear that prophetically about Keisha's word earlier, what we sang about, we will uproot the tent pegs that we put in place so that he can have an expanded home. He can have a bigger home. It is necessary for him to e increase. It's necessary for our tent to be increased for him in this season. It's necessary for me to be diminished. It's necessary for me to be winnowed, to separate the wheat from the chaff so that the tent that I provide for him is enlarged and effective and filled with fruit, not chaff not empty words. We want to, every encounter, to, we want to be filled with the real fruit. Just picture that plastic fruit like they have on display places, that waxy, hard thing. We don't want to carry that around with us. It's empty. There's nothing of nutritional value in it. And one other quick thing, it, said, it talked about in Isaiah 61 about rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the cities. And there's, um, I'm reading the story now, I've been reading the, the story about Nehemiah rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And, you know, they didn't have expert builders. They didn't have engineers rebuilding the walls. Every person that lived there contributed. Every person took it upon themselves to rebuild the walls. It wasn't just the prophets who are well known. It was everybody, the house of God, the ecclesia around the earth, big and small, every size, whether anybody knows your name or not. I had a dream just uh, a couple days ago where Chris Vallotton was um, had been given this incredible um, coveted position in the oil industry. And so he was now the one person that was going to be called upon any time a new oil well was discovered. But somebody was, everybody wanted this position and it was really respected and revered. But somebody was telling me but, that what we don't realize is that he was also still responsible for all of the other existing wells. And so he would be called upon every time they produced two, which meant the man would never rest. He would never have a down moment in his life. And I felt like prophetically that was a message about leadership. Leadership is being called to, called upon for new oil wells, for new revelation to be poured out. Okay. But the leaders are still responsible for the revelation that's already been poured out too, for the wells that have already been dug, but are still producing. Right. And they can't, leadership can't be the only person, the only person doing the work. Leadership can't be the only person rebuilding the wall of the city and rebuilding the ruined places. It takes everyone. In the dream, it was a call to say, we need to rally around this leader. We need to rally around and do our part with the prophetic, do our part with the ministry, do our part to speak the words into the body of Christ so that they can be receive healing and wholeness and that Isaiah 61 can happen. So this is a personal call for everyone hearing this message, a personal invitation to run towards winnowing, and a personal invitation to be, take on the responsibility of stewarding Isaiah 61 to the people of this world right now at this point in time. 
So, Papa, we just say thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the privilege and the honor of even being invited to participate with you. Thank you for the honor and the privilege to get to use our physical bodies right now to pursue this ministry, to pursue the fulfillment of your word on this earth. It's an honor and a privilege to get to worship you. It's an honor and a privilege to get to partner with you. So we just thank you from a most humble place for the invitation, for even hearing these words and saying that we are worthy of participating with you. And we say yes to you. We say yes to you. We invite your winnowing. We invite your threshing of us. Separate out the lies. We don't like the lies either. Everybody knows we don't like lies. They're tormenting, but we also don't want to carry around the fruitless aspects of our life. We don't want to carry around something that looks good to us, but really has nothing of value in it. So thresh us, winnow us. Please, Lord, we ask you, we invite you with all of our heart to winnow us, thresh us, separate out the wheat from the chaff. We want to be filled with the pure fruit of your spirit and what you've grown in us. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just move in a personal way for, for each person hearing this word, whether it's today or sometime in the future, that you would just move in a personal way. I ask that you would provide a hedge of protection around this message today, this word today, this call today, that you would provide a personal hedge of protection, that you would give us an understanding mind and a hearing heart, just like you gave Solomon in our individual moments when a time comes where we're invited to lay down on that threshing floor and receive the winnowing, help us to discern what you're doing in that moment. Help us to not be deceived by what's happening. Thank you for helping us to see those moments and those opportunities when we can yield to your winnowing. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the way you speak. I thank you that this house loves the way you speak in all of the weird and fun and quirky ways. And so we say, speak, 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 speak to us. Speak your words of life to us. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Papa God. We are so thankful for you and we honor you and worship you with all we do 24-7. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Cheryl to come and take up offering. So good. Well, you know, when I saw winnowing, I actually saw win now -ing. So when we're in the winnowing, it's the win now -ing. So that's a perspective for you. So good. Um, okay, I have some notes from little things that she said. Threshing comes after the reaping. And so it was amazing because when she said that, I saw that giving actually activates the threshing process because you sow in that moment, you get to see what you reap and it becomes threshed on what your heart motive was in it. So if you want to experience that threshing, quickest way to do it is in partnering with giving. He will be so good and faithful to show you what's behind what you're sowing. It's crazy. And it was cool because, you know, that what we're talking about when with threshing, threshing allows for wheat to actually fulfill its purpose, which is to become bread, which is food for other people. And so we want that process to happen to us so that we can be a drink for people, so we can be literal food for people um, who are hungry. And so giving does that. It is so crazy cool how it will just start to activate you. If you want to be winnowed, start practicing in the area of giving. So we got a couple ways you can do that today. We've got our box back there. Um, you can note, put cash and checks in there, notate on the envelope how you're giving. And then if you want to give electronically, we've got our website. It's onelifeok.com. So let's stand and do our offering decree. Papa, all abundance is in your hands. I say my heart is filled with gratitude today for all that you provide while I seek first the kingdom in my life. 
I say today that I will steward well what you put into my hands this year. I will seek wisdom for the abundance you are pouring out into my hands this year. This is the year of expansion and growth. So I speak to the north, south, east, and west and say, release what is the king's. Release what is meant for the kingdom. Release what is meant for growth. Release, release, release. I speak for the resources to be unlocked. I speak to any blockage to be unlocked. I speak to any finances that are in prisons to be unlocked. Unlock, unlock, unlock. I speak to creativity to be unhindered. I speak the favor of God and man over my life this year. I will use my creativity to expand. Creativity, arise, arise, arise. Papa, I say make way, make way for the king this year in my life and the life of my tribe through your abundance. There's more with you in 22. So I just bless this amazing word today. We just say, come, come, come and do your winning wings so we can be that threshing instrument for you. In Jesus' name, amen.